Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast series from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is Nick Cater. You work for the Menzies Research Centre, a body dedicated to the promotion of liberalism as a philosophy as much as a political cause. Am I right? Uh, yes, I, I guess I guess it is, Rob. I mean, when you're, when you're named after the great Robert Menzies, it's very hard not to focus on liberalism because, to my mind, he was the greatest articulator of liberal principles in Australia, certainly in the last century, uh, and possibly one of the greatest in the world. Nobody's quite nailed it, for my money, as clearly as he did. At the risk of oversimplifying what a great man once said, what, what was the heart of, of what he said that, that so impresses you? It's that uh, the independence of the individual is paramount. So we celebrate the, uh, the independent action, independent thought, independent behaviour above collective action. So uh, it, it's about uh, ordering society from the bottom up by letting individuals have a go um, but with responsibilities attached, of course, to, to ensure that they don't trample on the rights of others to have a go, uh, in the belief that that will create progress and a better and stronger social fabric than the other route, which is the centrally planned top-down route in which you think of society as, a, as an organism in which I'm just a little cog, if you like. That's not mixing metaphors. <laughs> It is somewhat. Uh, so for you, it's a basically a philosophy of how to organise a society. Yeah, essentially. And it's one, and to, to go straight to the hard questions you're about to ask me, I, it, it, is it enduring? Well, I think it has to be because in the end it's it's in tune with the human soul. And it's um, uh, certainly, you know, as you'd be familiar, it's in tune with the, the gospel, it's in tune with the... Uh, the Old Testament, it, it's its the way, you know, it comes from that tradition. Um, well, let, let me press back because I was going to ask you about how, rob how, rust, how robust is it? Um, and you say it's enduring because it really ma matches humanity. Mm. And people, there's a, people always yearn to be free. It's why um, the people of Poland, once they could see a chink in the armour and had a choice, went for freedom over a, a communist dictatorship. It, and, and, you know, that happens time and time again. I guess it's why a lot of people in Kabul and Afghanistan now are, are, are feeling terribly threatened because their freedom is being replaced. And it's why people of Hong Kong um, right now feel that their whole life has been turned upside down because China has come in and imposed quite a different order. Why is it not, therefore, more successful if it, if it is somehow mm. almost natural why isn't it more successful? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, we we thought it. I still think it 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 is successful, um, but it it has it it has challenges. One challenge of, is people who believe they should be in charge. They should be running the place. It, 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 it's 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 the other challenge is related. It's from utopianism. It's, it's the idea that. The way you know we can't just let things run as they are. We have to build a better society according to some ideological model. You know we can create a society without competition, in which you know people are uh, are on an equal level, in which you get paid according to what you need to eat and how you need to feed your children, and so forth. You know those sort of utopian dreams have come and gone, uh, but that remains a very strong instinct, and that that goes against liberalism because it implies you know somebody some smart people are going to order things rather than let things spontaneously um, organise themselves. Um, the other, politically, why it's constantly, uh, I was going to say struggling, why it's always, in a sense, at a disadvantage over, you know, a more utopian, more revolutionary philosophy is that it's not as exciting because in, in liberalism you believe in changing things incrementally um, and bringing the society along with you. You don't believe in throwing the whole lot out and starting again. Uh, and that's at various times in history that, that's proved less attractive in a political sense than the, you know, we can fix this once and for all, we can put a new system in place. You know, that's why liberalism 
uh, struggled in, in Britain in the early 20th century against, you know, the, the labor movement, against the suffragettes, against the Irish freedom movement, those kind of movements. And it's why it struggles. It doesn't struggle, but it, it, it finds it hard to compete on the same terms as, um, you know, transgender rights or, um, you know, climate change or climate emergency. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't see things as they do, and it sometimes doesn't seem such an exciting message to sell to people. Does it have a positive message, or is it really a message of let things be, let individuals? Right? Does it have a moral vision? Uh, it has very strong moral vision, and and that that moral vision is is that it's a belief that um, when people pursue their own ends. Um, you know, with with due responsibility for those around them, uh, that that will be the motive power of progress. That you know, if if all of us have given the the space and the and a system under which we can all, you know, go and work hard and realise, you know, put our money at risk, go to work, you know, get our kids to school, strive to get ahead. If you do that. Then the society will advance, uh, and it, it, so it's it's the motive power of progress. So you will see progress in a liberal society, and uh, this isn't an this isn't a utopian vision. I mean, it's a fact. It's a very pragmatic philosophy because you can see how it works. I mean, Australia is a brilliant example of it working. You know, right the way from its origins, it was a liberal nation in its in its is its default position, but expressly so since. Robert Menzies founded the Liberal Party in 1944. And, and I think that the, I'm, I'm convinced, others might not be, but I'm convinced that Australia would not be the, the economically strong, prosperous, free place to live that it is right now. It wouldn't be the place where so many people would want to come from around the world to live if we hadn't had that as our default position um, since World War II. It'd be a quite different country. I'm Rob Forsyth. This is a liberalism in question, and my guest today is Nick Cater. Nick, is there a sense in which liberalism is both a political philosophy of one party? You've mentioned Robert Menzies. But isn't there a bigger sense in which, in the terms in which you've put it, in, in, more, in more the vibe of the, the, vibe of the matter, mm. all, all major political parties are, in one sense, liberal in that sense, that they, they disagree upon details. But isn't that mm. the philosophy of all our political parties? At their best, mainstream, I, mainstream. I mean, I don't, I don't go to the Yeah, like I mean, uh, certainly the Labor Party at its best adheres to a very similar philosophy, a bit different around the margins. But um, you know, they, 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 I was interested to read a book. Actually, uh, I wrote a forward for it, so I had to read it. A biography by Keith De Lacey, who who, who was born as a com uh, to into a farm family of communists in in far north Queensland, joined the Labor Party, went to become a Labor. Treasurer, but you know, one of the things that struck me about Keith's book is that talking about his father and the advice his father gave to him, it was pretty a liberal kind of belief. You know, go on, you've got to have a go. The world doesn't own you, a living son. You go out and work hard and 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 get the rewards. That's a you know, it could could have come out of Robert Menzies' mouth. So yes, it's true. And um, one interesting thing about it's not definitely not tied to a party. It's just one party that decided. Um, to unite around that principle, uh, but it's certainly not tied to it. And and one of the continual <laughs> things that you face when you're director of the Menzies Research Centre is the big argument about whether you should put a capital L or a small L um, in, in a <laughs> sentence. Yes. Small yes. L be, has become synonymous with the, the left of the party, but actually when you're talking about liberalism as an adjective rather than names a party, it seems to be gra grammatically more correct to have a small L. <laughs> so small L means, it means the left of the Liberal Party. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're not... It won't go there. <laughs> no, it won't go there. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that it, it has been argued, I think, that there's there are some blind spots or some issues that liberalism raises. One is the issue of power and the other is the issue of inequality. And mm. the, uh, I want to start with power. Your emphasis upon the individual is make great right sense, except individuals have different power, and not not just power they've got either. By the way, their own hard power they've inherited, or um, we mm. don't all start at the same starting point. Do you might comment about that as is this a weakness in liberalism, or somewhere where liberalism needs to be be simply enhanced, 
or adapted to because it- well you're right i mean not everybody starts with the same chance in life i mean my my best advice i could give to any child is to choose your parents well right <laughs> because it makes yes. a big difference but this is this is this is one of the central sort of tensions in liberalism that it you know believes passionately in equality of opportunity right? that's its central passion really um but how do you reconcile that with the fact that it's it's you know impossible to achieve right if if you if you if you start life um in a remote aboriginal community um your your opportunities are far less than if you start life in the eastern suburbs of sydney and get sent to scots college so th- th- well, there is th- <laughs> not or maybe not, not scots but anyway uh, yes <laughs> yeah but 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 uh, nevertheless that principle applies that equal opportunity mm. and it comes from i think I could just draw you back to your former profession, Rob, to the church. It, 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 it's central to the gospel, isn't it? The idea that every person is equal before God, that everybody, every every soul deserves equal respect. And and that's what I think one of the great things about liberalism that 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 um I really revel in is just this everybody is is you know, nobody is innately superior to another. So that that's how I deal with the power question. Um but, but, on the, uh, I'll tell you that for a second, but uh, that can hide power. In other words, speaking like that uh, may actually hide the fact that there is power hidden away, uh, dressed up in individual responsibility and and I'm I, and merit. I deserve this because I've done better. Because the same tradition you've mentioned about the equality of each other in the in the Christian tradition also talks about concern for the powerless and the weak and uh, concern for justice. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, but. You know, over the over the centuries, we've evolved, and they're improving and still improve. But liberal institutions that that disperse power. So, right. um, I mean, I, I you know, one of the things that struck me about that first series of the Crown uh, was that the young Queen Elizabeth, even though she was queen, she basically had to negotiate with um, uh, at least two other people. You know the, the prime minister of the day, Winston Churchill, and um, and uh, her, her secretary in the palace. Like you know, unless she got them on board, she couldn't do anything. That's just a clear example of the way we've established these uh, institutions, none of which have our ul- ultimate power. So that's that's the lib- right. institutional liberal response to this challenge, and and I believe that is also true in. In a liberal democracy, and the, the great thing is, you know, as the Tocqueville said, it is possible in a democracy for politicians to depart from the will of the people, but not very far and not for very long. <laughs> I mean, that's where well, you've got three elections every three years. That's particularly true. Uh, could you also add the rule, the rule of law here? Because mm. the concept of equality before the law surely is a crucial protection of yeah, power. And when, it, that's, it, when that's corrupted by crony politics or crony crony capitalism, that's a perversion of the liberal of a liberal society. Even if it's dressed up as being mm. pro-business or pro- No, I, absolutely absolutely the, uh, the the rule of law, equality before the law, the fact that even the monarch is subject to the law is yes. central to this this evening out of power and a and what we conceive of as a, a fair society. And, and you see in very you know, egalitarianism is particularly strong in Australia. And I can say that as a as a migrant to this country, albeit thirty two years ago. But I, I just remember that wonderful um, egalitarianism that that exists here. You know, the principle, certainly before COVID, that you would sit in the front of the taxi. Right? You wouldn't sit behind. You'd say thank you to the bus driver. All those sort of things are part of showing respect for people. And when mm. people abuse, when people go against it, uh, as um, for instance, you know when when Julia Gillard's partner um, went to a football match where he thought he was at a VIP pass and he he didn't, and he said to the person at the gate, "Don't you know who I am?" I mean, you say that in Australia, you are finished, right? <laughs> that never yes, got you yes, into any football yes. ground anywhere. Uh, <laughs> exactly, and it's it's been said by more more than once. The other issue is 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 equality. It's almost inevitable, I believe, that if you have a society based upon individual freedoms and 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 enterprise you'll get different outcomes it's inevitable 
Yeah, absolutely it is. And you, 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 not only that, but you're welcome it. Um, I was you're so, welcome I, it. Yeah, because it's what, what you know, the, the incentive to get a margin above uh, the average is what drives people to do better and makes them work hard. Now, if, if you're only going to end up with the same, you know, the same share of the pie, then where's where's the incentive? I, I love that expression from D.H. Lawrence, again, from his book Kangaroo. You know, in Australia, it's okay uh, to be, uh, it, uh, it's okay to be better off than your neighbour, but not better. And I think that's that's that sums up that egalitarian principle. But for all sorts of reasons, uh, um, a a productive market based economy works because some people will get better, more do better than others. If it if it didn't, you know, it would have make no sense whatsoever. I'm Rob Forsyth. This is a liberalism question. My guest is Nick Cater. Um, I heard recently that the comment made that liberalism, in a sense, evolved out of fear of tyranny and, and, um, mm. and centralism. But at the same time, other fears can um, affect liberalism. And I'm thinking particularly of the, the experience of the last couple of years, um, mm. the fear of serious mass death, whether it's realistic or not, I'm not going into, unlike everyone else, I'm not an epidemiologist. <laughs> um, mm. But... Do you want to comment? As I said about, before, you're the, only, you're the only person I've met in the last well, year, are, at least, no, who wasn't an expert <laughs> epidemiologist. Well, well anyway, I, am, I am not. I am not one. So that's that's a special thing here for the CIS. But I want to <laughs> ask about that um, without getting into too much of the detail. And we all know that um, there have been stupid things and heartless things decided and dumped. It makes no sense. So they're, they're obviously wrong and, and foolish, despite the fact of the stubbornness of premiers and others not admitting that. But pulling back from that detail issue. What What is your view about the big response to the threat of COVID uh, in a liberal society? Have we got it wrong? Or is it just simply well, liberalism, liberalism adapting to a crisis and really it's not a problem or we'll go back well when it's all over? Well, I think you, you've hit the problem nail on the head and that's, that's fear. Um, and there's, there's, there's a, there's, you know, a good reason why almost every tyrant who comes to power does so on the ba- on the back of a narrative of fear, um, usually of an external threat. Right? You know, I've got a, you know, you've got to elect this strong man because otherwise nobody else can deal with, you know, uh, the problem of rioting on the streets or the problem of, you know, um, you know, subversive elements in our midst, whatever it is. It, or every tyrant really starts out that way. So that's one reason to be worried about people who pay off fear, uh, but it certainly leads to illiberal responses so you know if this can if 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 you exaggerate a threat and and i'm uh, let's not go into whether they've exaggerated this one or not but if if you exaggerate a threat then that gives you license to introduce you know uh, tyrannical measures and and i i think that's not too strong a word to use for some of the stuff that we've seen in australia in response to covid this absolute trampling on people's liberties and rights, you know, the freedom to worship, um, which in a way seems almost one of the smallest things they've trampled on, although it's a big one, of course. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the the emergency powers granted to a premier, so like Dan Andrews, where he doesn't have to ever take this stuff to his own cabinet or or caucus, let alone to parliament. So this, is, this leads to basically, you know, a rule, autocratic rule, and, and we we don't welcome it. Um, you know, you, you have to you have to accept that in in emergency situations, world time or other, of course, we're going to have to push the boundaries of of what's acceptable because there's a bigger battle to fight. But you want to see these measures disappear pretty quickly afterwards. I think. Have you been surprised, given your remarks, Nick, about Australians, how? relatively accepted people have been of quite quite astounding limitations that would have been unthought I must say from my unthought of um, three years ago uh, yeah yes I have I was um, but then um, I guess when I twigged what it what was driving this which is fear and fear mm. of the unknown yeah you know, it's, it's 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 quite understandable that people were fearful of this thing. We'd never had it before. We didn't know how it acted. We didn't know how dangerous it was. Although we did pretty quickly, um, and and so that was there already. 
Uh, and then I think you've had, and this to me is just uh, really despicable, unconscionable behaviour by political leaders, but you've had premiers, not all of them, but some, who have seen political advantage in stoking up that fear and being seen to be the, the one who can rescue and save everybody. So that to me is is almost the lowest a, 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 a politician can get, playing to this ignoble emotion of fear instead of appealing to higher emotions like, you know, charity and love thy neighbor, help thy neighbor. You know, I mean, why didn't we have more than that, more like that, more of that, Rob, in this crisis? You know, that spirit of mm. let's all get together. Let's go and there's, there's old people who are doing it tough. Why don't we get together and have a way of getting food around to them and talking to them through their letterbox or whatever, you know, but we could have done that with that sort of people, but none of that was. I've well, heard some not, of that actually. Not but not much of it. Does this imply that for liberalism to, to succeed in society, the society need, in a sense, to have um, some level of confidence and optimism? Because when a society is fearful, they don't want to trust. Uh, they want someone to tell them what to do, uh, to give us the rules. Am I right? Mm. Liberalism almost depends upon a, a certain sunny outlook on life to succeed in the long term? Mm. It does, yeah. It certainly does. And it doesn't... Um and and it, it's not doesn't depend on the circumstances. Like you can be optimistic and upbeat in the most extraordinary difficult circumstances. I mean, to go back uh, to my hero again, Robert Menzies. I mean, he gave that forgotten people speech, which most people would be familiar with. You know, um, very significant political speech. He gave it in May 1942 when they were wow. digging. <laughs> they were digging trenches in the in the in in. In parks in Sydney and turning the, the, the there, town there were hall submarines station, in, yeah, there submarines, were submarines in the har in the harbour. You know, we were actually under attack. Yeah, and, and it was I don't know three weeks, not long after the bombing of Darwin. But he doesn't talk about the war at all. Even at the most the hardest, the most dangerous right? point in the war for Australia, he's just talking about hope for the future, what we do after the war, how we build a better and stronger country in which, you know, prosperity and justice thrives. That's that's his message. So I think that we wanted, we, we wish, I wish we'd seen more of that in COVID, um, but that's, that's, liberalism does require people to be optimistic about the future. Yes, yeah, certainly does. Uh, and they have every reason to if, if, you, if you follow a liberal pattern because there's no, yet no example of a liberal society failing, um, they can always do better. They should always try and constantly improve, but they never fail in the way that, say, Venezuela failed or the Soviet Union. You know, since liberalism, as you said earlier, is not a utopian philosophy, and uh, that's come through in a number of conversations mm. I've had in this series, it requires a level of compromise of dealing with, it's not exciting at one level, but another level it does need a, a leadership with, with, with a vision, a moral vision perhaps, rather than just... Mm. I believe in individualism, but, but uh, uh, am I right? Uh, liberalism requires more than just yeah. compromise. It and, requires a moral vision. And if so, what is does. that vision? Um, I, I, and we need more of that. More, and I think we've, in a way, um, in Australia, but around the, the, the Western world, I think the centre-right has been less willing to talk about that moral vision Um it, it 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 kind of is like it's trapped in the nineteen seventies and eighties, fighting those ba battles about, which the CIS does so well, of course, about about you know economic rationalism and and uh, deregulation and all those important things we did, fixing the economy basically, you know, fixing the the ledger, and and um, and it's almost like it's come to think that is liberalism. But it's not. That's only uh, part of it. You know, they're, they're not everything you can measure in pounds, shillings, and pence. You know, or dollars and cents. It, 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 there, there's there's things like justice and civi civility and civilization. Those are the things which liberals used to talk about, but they talk about far less now. I mean, certainly we've allowed that whole phrase "social justice" to be stolen and misused by by people on the left of politics, where it's no reason it should shouldn't be a a goal of the liberal side of politics too. Uh, one reason I'm having this very serious is by a similar conviction. A small government's all very well, but, but for what? <laughs> what's, mm. what's, what is what is the good for people out of this? In fact, mm -hmm. I, uh, I said that the word, say, neoliberalism is 
I don't know if it was used much, but is now regarded as a critical a word of criticism. Yeah, because and it's I regarded think, as entirely think, about economics, entirely about economics. And, and I, think that, I think that, that exactly, and I think that's um, that's a fair criticism. I mean, it's obviously that's that neo neoliberal argument is used too too widely and too broadly by the left, but it's it's a fair it's a fair criticism that that you know. I mean, of course, there's something going fundamental about economics, about about uh, allowing people to thrive and countries to thrive economically. Because without that, you can't achieve a lot of the other things you want. Um, but um, you you you've got to, I suppose, recognise that that is it, it, running the economy right and, and getting a growing economy is really not a means in itself. It's a means towards an end, and that end yes. is. Is more 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 satisfied, more happier people in which, you know, it, wealth is more evenly spread, spread, and and people, you know, have are able to engage in the things that really matter, you know, like I, like family I, and I, friends and and faith. I wonder, Nikita. I wonder, Nikita. One of the problems is that liberalism has, has been allowed itself to have a morally thin framework, at which. Mm. I'm thinking of J.S. Uh, Mill, where the only thing that's wrong is harming others um, and no, no real vision of the good life or of, of human flourishing other than that. And therefore, when you get harming others, the only evil and, and lack of choice, yeah. you end up with a modern world in which all moral issues, at least at the more extreme end of, the, of social media, is all about who you're harming. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, and the only consent, and, the, and uh, someone pointed out to me the other day, uh, all the discussion about sexual behaviour is almost entirely reduced to consent, rather than about mm. what's loving and, and what's good for people. Yeah, this, oh, yeah, is it, absolutely. Is this a sign effect of the show that, that liberalism has allowed itself to become too thin morally? Um, well, it's, it's it's a it's a broad statement because I know lots of liberals who who you know would would absolutely agree with what you just said and would argue strongly. Um, for it, but 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 I yeah I think as a movement we we've we've become too focused on on the economy and, and narrow things like that without thinking about yeah. these broader issues. I mean, basically, you know, a lot of those things you're talking about, you can trace back to the '60s, I guess. You know, this sort of um, yes, I was uh, there. breakdown of yeah, and. <laughs> You're probably responsible for it, Robert. I don't know, but, no, but I mean seriously, we can trace these things back to the sixties, and and these changes one by one have had profound consequences for society, for the family, for the makeup of the society, for the way we interact with one another, and and some for the better, but most you know have had very negative consequences. But liberals have have been very reluctant to fight back against them, and still are. You know, we're still. Uh, find it hard to fight back against some of the, you know, let's say the the tyranny in the embedded in the transgender rights movement or any of those things because we don't want to kind of stick our head above the parapets and look like, yeah. you know, intolerant old fashioned people. So we've got to learn to talk about those things. Now, can, can, I, can I raise that question? Do, do you see a threat, a genuine threat, to liberalism from what I call the the, the, the morally um, extreme? Because our moral extremists. A new kind of Puritanism with that's been unkind on Puritans, I think, but coming from mm. concerns with um, sexism, race issues, transgender issues, all all at one level worthy from one point of view, but another point of view highly illiberal. Uh, very illiberal. Um, I mean, the goals may sound you know, broadly something we'd agree with, but they're extremely liberal, and and the the, the reason the reason is because they're they're framed in terms of a society in which, which is power imbalances, you know, is the biggest and most important thing driving society. No, I don't believe that is, but they think so. So they, they, they see all these in terms of power imbalances that must be corrected by, you know, uh, by, you know, of quite illiberal means. One, you know, one so, uh, and, and so it, they power, are liberal. I mean yeah. If there's only, if yeah. the only thing in society is power, there's not anything else. This, if you reduce things down to power, this sort of Michael Foucault view of the world, then the only way to deal with power is other power, which means yeah. arguments don't really matter, right? And I think the other category mistake they make is to 
to think of the whole world in terms of classes of people, right? It's one class in a power battle against another. Now, that's never been correct. I mean, Marx is, you know, bourgeois versus the workers or whatever it was, you know, the capitalist versus the workers. Those divisions were always forced and false divisions. Um, and, um, you know, I, one of the reasons... I don't hear communism- them. I don't hear them. I don't hear them much today. I, in fact, class often is forgotten, it seems to be today. It's much more in terms of, of race and gender and these issues rather than class. Yeah, but um, it's the same dynamic happening, Rob. You've got the, it, it's, a, it, it's a class of, you know, uh, it's, white people. It's tribalising. It's tribalising. Tribal, it's it's tribalised. Yeah. Yes. And, and, the, and, the, and the only way in their estimation to, to improve society is to, is to address those power imbalances. But I don't think that's necessarily so, particularly in a, 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 a society as liberal as Australia, where, where you know, there's no barrier really to success apart from your own failings. Time's running out, but can I shift to, to another very huge question, which I, we can't spend our time on, about exporting liberalism. Uh, this year we saw the, the, the end of the endless war in Afghanistan, and one thing came about, um, it was an attempt to export liberalism. And I think mm. on any message, at least in the short term, there may be long-term benefits hidden beneath the mess that may, may flourish, but it looks like it's been a complete failure. And I can think of other mm. places too where this is done. Uh, is liberalism genuinely exportable? Or does it have, um, to grow in it? It has to, have to grow in place? Well, I think it is exportable, but I think it's much more, it's because liberalism is much more complex than we think, or, or liberal democracy. Um, and uh, here I, mean, I should pay tribute to, to your, your esteemed director, Tom Switzer, who, who I used to have discussions about this with right at the start of the Iraq war, and he, he was adamant that, you know, it was, a, it was mistaken to think we could take democracy and liberalism yes. to those He still lands. holds and, that view to this day. I, I and he must, he, he must think he was, uh, he's been right all along, you know, maybe. I mean, there's still an argument that we, we should have held on a lot longer and worked harder at it. But I think so. I mean, I think what I, my, my realisation is how rich the concept of democracy is and and the bit where you go into a polling booth and tick on a, or put a cross on a, on a ballot paper and put it in the box, that's just the time, that's just the sort of top level of democracy, you know. It's what happens underneath that's important. And, yes. You know, trying to instill into a non-democratic country that you're trying to make democratic, for instance, the principle that it's okay to beat uh, your opponent, but it's not okay to put them in prison afterwards. Just those sort of little niceties seem to be a little well, well, harder well, well, to get more, across. In fact, they're more than niceties. I, I take your point, but they're actually deep cultural issues. I mean, liberalism grew out of Western European exported cultures, both in Europe itself and then exported to the New World and down here in Australia. There's a way in which mm. you might argue. Now, there have been good examples. Korea, South Korea, for all its issues. Japan. Mm. Um, Taiwan. I, Taiwan. And it, although Singapore is not that liberal from some points of view, <laughs> there's still a sense mm-hmm. in which, uh, in fact, one of my guests was in Singapore talking about this to me. So it can, it, it can be developed other than a Western context, but it, but it does have a deep cultural, historical foundation, and therefore it's not easily transported. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, this is, these are big questions, uh, and I'm sort of loath to make sweeping generalisations, but I think it, 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 it's kind of particularly suited to a Christian tradition um, because, as I say, I mean, it stems from the Christian tradition, from the Gospels, from the Old Testament, uh, many of its principles, but also to uh, Confucian societies because they have the same emphasis on individual yes. effort, you know, working out your own salvation. And and, and, on, uh, the, and it's not an accident that the only the only democracy in the Middle East is the Jewish state of Israel, whatever you think of the state. That's yeah, again, deep, yeah. deep, so, in, Jew, in, Jew, deep in Jewish tradition too. Yeah. So, I mean, there's obviously, uh, there are, uh, you know, reasonably stable democracies in Middle East, in, in sorry, Muslim-dominated countries. But I think in, it, it, it's harder. Mm, uh, yeah, Indonesia, Malaysia. Probably. Is it pro- yes. probably the closest? Yeah. Yeah. But it, it just seems to adapt better to those societies. Um, yes. And uh, 
I think um, you, people have the instinct to individualism um, and also um, their, their blame. The interesting thing is that they internalise blame as Confucian and Christian. You, you go, well, if there's something wrong, what did I do wrong? Um, and that's that's a terrific uh, liberal uh, instinct uh, because it leads to self improvement, right? But if you if your attitude is there's something wrong, what did my neighbour do to me, um, and how can I punish him for it? You know, you 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 don't get the same liberal instinct for continual improvement, which is a central part of liberalism. That's very interesting. My my guest is Nick Cater. Can I ask you lastly, Nick? Are you are you an optimist about liberalism? Oh you yeah. <laughs> I, I certainly am, um, because I can't see why anybody would accept anything else once they um, once they think about it, once they try out. I mean, it's it's a surprise that we have to keep back up, go back arguing for it, because you know the opposite, the sort of organised totalitarian type of society is, doesn't have a great track record, right, on anything. So I'm surprised to me that we have to continue to go back and argue. I am, I am optimistic, and I'm optimistic in countries like Australia, like the United States, like Britain, where they have very strong liberal institutions. And, you know, that central point about no one institution having total power. So power has to be negotiated and it's dispersed. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that liberalism can't collapse and we've always got to be on our guard for it, but it makes it a whole lot difficult, more difficult for it to collapse because there'll always be, you know, the court's, might decide against what Parliament has said, or Parliament might change the law because the courts are trying to exert. You know, all these tensions and and things happen, and in the end, you know, it looks sometimes look a bit confusing up close up. The overall effect is is to keep stability and build a better society. And maybe it needs more more uh, heroes out there spe speaking for it and defending <laughs> it rather than take it for granted. That may, that that may be the biggest danger. Yeah. My guest today, my I'm, my guest today has been uh, Nick Cater, the director of the Menzies Research Centre in Sydney. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been an independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Head to cis.org.au to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.